Welcome everyone. We are back with another episode on the recruiter's perspective. And my guest today uh, has a very different perspective than some of the other recruiters that I have had on. Adrian Chapman works for Cover 3 Consulting and he is actually an agency. So he runs an agency and he partners with organizations to help with recruiting and staffing among other things. I'll let him uh, talk about that in just a second. But before we get into that, I have to talk about how Adrian and I got connected because this is the power of your network and I think a little bit of help with LinkedIn as well. So I put a post out on LinkedIn asking for recruiters for a last minute event and a friend of mine that I went to grad school with actually tagged Adrian in this and I was like, hey, you know, we already got ourselves covered for this event, but I have a podcast <laughs> and it would be great for you to come and talk about what you do. And the rest is history. Adrian is here. And so you just never know. You never know who's going to be connected to somebody who might be able to help you out in your career, in your business. So Adrian, thank you so much for being here. I'm so glad that Beth was able to get us connected. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about your company and what you're doing. Sure. No, I appreciate you uh, having me on and, and inviting me. I'm glad Beth could connect us. And, and to your point, you know, um, in the world that we both live in here, like, it's just amazing to see how one connection, right, one, um, you know, simple introduction can completely sometimes change your trajectory. And that's why I do what I do. Um, because sometimes just having a conversation with me or, um, you know, someone that I know, could set your life on a completely different course. So yeah. Absolutely. And you ask uh, just about what we do as well. Yes. Yeah. I want to know, uh, because you are an agency, I know you do some recruiting, yeah. but can you just describe what your company does for organizations? Yeah. So uh, Cover 3 Consulting is um, a recruiting firm in the transportation and logistics industry primarily. So um, really, we serve um, freight forwarders and um, third-party logistics companies, as well as transportation technology companies, and then distribution and warehousing companies. So those are kind of the few different buckets we recruit within. Um, we chose that industry because it was uh, where I had a, the most expertise um, in recruiting. And then also it's just a ginormous uh, industry that's continuing to grow. And uh, I also just really like the people uh, in there too. So <laughs> there's a ton of opportunity and, and it's growing. Um, what we do is we partner with those companies um, and uh, our goal is really to help them grow. So, I mean, yes, we, we recruit. I mean, some people might call uh, a recruiting firm a headhunter, right? Mm -hmm. um, which, you know, uh, some people have like a negative connotation to that. I don't care. Like, you know, that's, that's what we do. We go find people. Um, but, you know, our hope is to really truly be like growth advisors for them. I mean, even yesterday mm -hmm. I met with a client of mine and, you know, we had an hour long conversation about how to get their business from, you know, uh, 50 million in revenue um, logistics company to 100 million uh, in, in revenue and how, you know, building a sales engine for them, how they could do that and what kind of talent they needed to attract um, and a sales team that they needed to build. So that's what we do. We, we find great talent um, and um, place them with the, the right companies with the right values. I love that. I think sometimes people don't understand the role that external or agency recruiters can play for organizations, but I, I love what you're doing and I love that growth mindset for organizations. I think that's, that's so great. Can you tell me a little bit about some of the more common types of positions that you'll recruit for? Like, is it across the board within supply chain or yeah. are there kind of specific things that you guys tend to focus on? We focus a lot on leadership roles. So um, within those buckets that I mentioned earlier, you know, anywhere from like manager, director, um, you know, team leader, supervisor, vice president, um, we really like to focus on those, but we'll, we do some depending on kind of what the role is, um, you know, everywhere from like, uh, a salesperson um, to, you know, um, you know, an operations person, so an operations associate, um, a carrier salesperson, as it may be, um, 
all the way up to, like I said, a, a vice president, uh, kind of depending on the structure of the organization. Okay. Okay. So that's good. I think for the audience to know as well, because there are other, I have a friend who does something similar, but they do more warehouse mm -hmm. recruiting. Um, so more of the like hourly type positions right. that mm -hmm. are kind of the lower level positions. And so you yep. guys are doing more on the leadership side. So I think that's a really good distinction to make because some, I think sometimes people forget in supply chain, it's, it is a business entity <laughs> and there are business functions within it not just, you know, warehouse workers and truck drivers and all mm -hmm. those types of components. So I'm so glad that we get to talk about that today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The best way to describe it would be like most of the roles we fill are what I would call like a white collar role, um, be it uh, sales or operations management and, and things like that. Um, More your knowledge we, workers. That's right. Yeah, data analysts, mm -hmm. um, things like that. We, we will fill roles there. Um, yeah, there are moments where we might fill some blue collar roles, but mostly it's going to be what I would call like a white collar uh, knowledge worker for sure. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Okay. Let's talk about the great resignation because that <laughs> okay, has been yeah. something that has impacted quite a few industries. Um, and based on some previous conversations I've had, I know that um, supply chain related companies have been impacted as well. Yeah. Since you work with different types of companies, multiple companies, what have you been seeing? How has the great resignation impacted this industry? That's a good question. Um, you know, for, for me, for, uh, a, an agency, we, we we lag behind the supply chain and logistics industry. Right. And that typically lags based off of, uh, you know, manufacturers and, distributors, right? So as they go, so then we will go at some point. Um, so if there is high demand for goods uh, and products, um, then there's going to be more demand for transportation services. As there's more demand for transportation services, there's going to be more demand for uh, employees, which means we're more in demand. Um, as that has continued to grow, um, we hit this great resignation point. And, and I described it in an, in an interview recently that's Simply put, where, where we've come is um, right now, because the market is so hot, um, that means that a lot of people are looking around and saying, I feel like I may be valued more by the marketplace than I am where I currently am working. Um, and they're asking that question, am, could I be more valued somewhere else? And that's why you're seeing that the great resignation is because people are looking around, whether whether it's Hey, I could be paid more. I could work, work remotely potentially, um, or I could just work in an environment where maybe I feel more appreciated with the world we live in today with uh, just social media and uh, we can communicate instantly. Whether it's completely true or not, it feels like there's a lot of people over here who are maybe a lot happier. They have a lot better opportunities than I am. And I've got to ask myself that question Am I? Am I valued is, is a question that I think a lot of people are, are asking. And the, the other side of that is, if not now, just coming off of COVID, if not now, when, am I, when would I make that move? Uh, and I think that's that kind of combination of things came together and people said, you know, maybe, maybe I do try something different. Right, right. You know, and I think you bring up a good point too, you know, the remote work piece has mm. been such a huge driver for many people. But I know I used to work with a lot of um, students who were interested in supply chain back in my higher ed days. And a lot of those positions require you to be, you know, on site there, there isn't right. necessarily a remote opportunity. Um, and especially, you know, some of those, like, you know, the warehouse position, trucking, all that, right. there is no, yeah. like it is what it is, <laughs> you know? And I think that in all the talk around the great resignation, there are quite a few industries where some of that flexibility doesn't exist. Yeah. And so we have yeah. to be really honest about, is this a position that can warrant it in relation to the rest of the organization? And is that fair? You know, so right. as people are questioning that for themselves, they have to put themselves in the shoes of the organization and what they have the ability to offer, depending on, you know, the nature of the work that they do. 
you, I, I love that, that point of, I, I, and I think it's right is, is we've got to be honest with ourselves and, and companies have to be honest with ourselves too. And I think as a candidate, right. So if I'm looking out there, the reality is at least from what I see every day is while there is more remote work than I've ever seen ever before, and I think it will continue um, that or just flexible work, whatever that means. Um, you know, I think that will continue to grow. However, there are so many companies who just aren't prepared to go fully remote yet. And so while we might all want that, and it sounds like the ideal perfect scenario, um, you have to, you have to say, maybe if I, if I like the people, if I like the company, if I like the mission, um, is that more important than just working remotely? And for some people it may, and some people that may not be, and I get that. Um, but you know, we have to be honest, like, is that, is there as many remote opportunities as I think there are? And am I willing to wait around for one of those while I have to also pay the bills, right? <laughs> like <laughs> there's, there's a, uh, there's a crux there. So. Right. 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 Oh my gosh. Okay. I love that. I love this conversation because I just think this piece of it doesn't get talked about enough. So sure. I, I, I appreciate that perspective as well. Let's talk about what, what does hiring look like? So you're an agency, you work with different organizations to help them hire. How do you find applicants? Because I'm guessing it's not necessarily a traditional ATS system. Like we've been talking about, like, how mm -hmm. do you guys go about sourcing and finding candidates for your clients? Yeah. So uh, we get that question, you know, fairly often, like, what are you guys going to do that's different than, than what we do? And the answer is like, oftentimes, m maybe not a whole lot different. We're just better at it than most companies. <laughs> and the reason I say that is not because not to be, you know, bold or to, you know, uh, arrogant or anything like that. It's just simply, I use a fishing analogy, right? Um, I say hire a guide if you want to go fishing because they're going to show you where the fish are. We're the guide, right? We're the fishing guide um, as an agency because every single day we're on that river, we're on that lake, so we know where the fish are. And we know as the seasons change where they're going economically, um, what they're biting on, what they're interested in. And as a company, you're focused on your company. Right? You're focused on you know, whatever good or product or service that you are selling um, and so that those, then the ebbs and flows of when you are hiring and when you are not, you may not be as good at finding those people initially as we may be. So how do we do that? We, I kind of use, um, it's really simple. Like I don't, we don't have any secrets. Like there's really four buckets that we, we search in. Like first one is, um, what I just call like a farmer bucket and, um, or pond that you should fish in, meaning, like people, um, or sorry, referral pond, meaning people that you know, right? So we reach out to our network, which we think we have a pretty vast network, you know, um, thousands upon thousands of people in the transportation industry that we've worked with, we've placed, um, so on and so forth. And we're like, hey, we've got this role. Do you know anybody? Because we believe good people know good people. And as a company, I would tell you, reach out to your best employees and say, you know, see if someone that you know can also um, do this job that we're looking for. So there's a level of trust there. So that's one is, is referrals. Two is farmers, is a farmer pond. Um, and that's reaching out to people who are closely connected to your industry. So, you know, maybe they're uh, a professor at a university. Maybe it's, um, you know, a pastor of a church who has, you know, they understand the values that you're looking for. Maybe it's, a, you know, a close friend um, you know, that understands kind of what you do and it cares for you, is, is for you and your business. Create a list of farmers um, and then, you know, ask them for, for help there. So that's what we do. Uh, and then three, I would say, is kind of your built-in networking type of events, whether that's trade shows, whether that's career fairs, um, things like that where people are naturally coming together make a list of ones that would relate well to your business. Um, and that's how we go and we recruit in, in those and try to find people. And then lastly, online, right? We use online tools like LinkedIn um, to say, hey, we want to go and find and use the Boolean searches and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and market and use marketing tools to, to get in front of people um, in that way. And, you know, of course, the, the phone, right? The old fashioned phone. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes. Okay. I, I have to point out a couple things because I think that there is a mindset and mentality right now that applying online is the only way to get a position. Um, and I know as a career coach, I am constantly talking about building your network, constantly talking yeah. about being connected to professionals in your industry. And I think that some of that has been lost um, and especially the last mm. couple of years, right? And that's just been circumstances of what's been going on right, in the world. Right, right. But when I hear you talk about how you are looking for talent, it is primarily through connections. It is through mm. people. It is it is having that network and being connected. So like if you're in supply chain, you better be following Adrian. <laughs> you better be connected to Adrian yeah. in some way because yeah, yeah. I know he has a massive network on LinkedIn. Right. And so it's understanding that you can sit by and passively apply to positions online, or you can start to build that network, get involved with your professional associations, go to those events that you roll your eyes at because you don't necessarily want to take the time to go do yeah. it because you just don't know when an opportunity is going to prevent present itself. Um, so I really appreciate that because I think sometimes, even though we talk about networking a lot, people, I don't know, like, I don't think people are really hearing it and, and able to apply it in a way that is really helpful. So I think understanding how you are looking for people helps give them that more applicable look at it. Julia, you're spot on. And, and, and I, you know, I stress people out. I think <laughs> I'm obviously like, I'm an extroverted guy, right. You know, and, and I'm, you know, pretty type A driven, you know, like that's, that's me. And then, you know, if you're someone who's not, so I know it feels stressful to be like, Oh gosh, networking sounds like it's the worst, you know, I get it, but um, hear me out. Think about it this way. Right. Um, th there's the old saying fortune favors the bold. Right. And, and sometimes, you know, you, you're thinking about taking risks and stuff like that, but like, don't, don't think about it that way. Think about it in a pretty practical situation. Right. If I, let's say I'm hiring something, someone for cover three consulting, and I've got two equally skilled candidates, right? But one of them over here is someone who is um, a friend of uh, a college teammate of mine. And this uh, young person has reached out to me a couple of times. We've had coffee um, and he said, hey, I'm, I'm interested in learning about your industry. You know, I kind of want to know what you do. I'm not sure what I want to do yet. Um, but I'm trying to learn, I'm trying to seek. And then I've got this other applicant who I've, ne I've, I've never spoken to before, right? I don't have any rapport with, um, and they're throwing their name in the hat into an online applicant tracking system. Will I interview both? Probably. Is there a likelihood that this person is going to get the job? Yes, right? This person over here who has, I have a relation, I've developed a relationship with, then there's two reasons, right? One, rapport and relationship are really important. And two, there's also just like expediency, meaning like because I have that rapport, they're going to come to my mind first. So I may reach out to them first for the job when I realize I have an open role. And this person over here may never get the chance because they didn't know I had an open role. Uh, they didn't know that um, I might be thinking of adding this new position. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. And okay. I have two things. One, what you're talking about is the hidden job market, um, 100%, yep. which is so interesting. I don't know if you've seen this on LinkedIn, but um, I've seen recruiters talking about the hidden job market and how it doesn't exist anymore. And it's not a thing. I've seen so many posts about that. And immediately I'm like, it is absolutely a thing. And what you just described is what it is. It's being on yep. somebody's radar and understanding sure. that like, you're gonna be the person that they call when the thought of a job pops up for them, you know, and it's having that role basically filled before it goes live on a website. Um, and so that's what the hidden job market is. That's not really what it used to be, but that is what it is now. Um, so there's that also, I gotta speak for the introvert. So I'm an introvert. Most people don't know that because I have a podcast <laughs> and <laughs> I'm a coach. Sure. But I'm very much introverted. And when I would do networking events and things like that, like I was the shy person that did not want to work a room, didn't feel comfortable doing that, <laughs> you know, and what I, 
I, I have some like really clear strategies that I have to share with the introverts because yeah. this is what helped me feel more comfortable. Um, one is volunteering. So if you're doing any mm, kind of event, um, a conference, something like that, always volunteer because you get forced to kind of talk to people, but you are at least in a position where you understand what you're doing and all of that. Um, I used to do registration. I love doing registration because you got to meet everybody and you mm -hmm, got to see yeah. who worked where and what they did. And then that was a more natural in later if I saw them at the conference. Um, mm -hmm. Also find yourself an extrovert. Uh, yeah, find an extrovert. Sure. <laughs> Have yeah. that extroverted friend, friend yeah. who will go up and introduce you to everyone. <laughs> hey everybody, this is Julia. You know, like <laughs> you should meet her. She's fantastic. Yeah, find, find one of those. <laughs> yes, um, and have a plan. So if if a, an event, if you know who's going to be there, um, if you do some kind of sleuthing ahead of time, if you get a guest list ahead of time, target people and have a plan to go and talk to them and reach out to them because then you're going to be more comfortable. It's not a random conversation. You're going into it with purpose, um, which is usually totally. where introverts have a, a harder time is just kind of the the surface level conversation. So, and don't stress yourself out, you know, like sometimes conversations are awkward and weird and it just is what it is, but. Right. And I mean, I, I love what you said. I think those are perfect tips and, you know, having a plan is so, so crucial. And, you know, for everybody out there, like, let me just give you permission. If you're concerned about networking, like I'm going to give you permission, like go have a plan, but like, yeah, you go, go talk to someone and it's okay. Like they, they're, 100% someone is going to think you're weird. That's just going to happen, right? <laughs> but but there's all you need. And then this goes back to, I don't remember if we talked about, well, at the very beginning, right? All you need is one person who could literally drastically change the trajectory of your life. And that's what you're looking for is that opportunity. And so, you know, if you have 10 people who are kind of look at you sideways, but one person says, yeah, you know, I would, I would love to answer your questions, you know, um, Fantastic. That that's what it takes. And, you know, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of just literally being, Hey, can I ask you some questions? Can I take you to coffee? Yes. Something like that, or even making it simpler than that. Like, can I ask you just three questions? I, I wanted to know, you know, um, how you got started in the industry, how you got to the level uh, that, that you got, and then what you would recommend for me trying to get in the, something that simple, right? right? Like suddenly, like you have a pathway to say like, Somebody could be like, no, I'm way too busy. I'm sorry. Or they might be like, hey, I might know someone you should connect with. Right. Or they'll say, yeah, I'll take, you know, 30 minutes and grab coffee with you. That could literally change your trajectory. So, right. You never right. Know. Okay. I have to make a plug for both of us. So you have <laughs> okay. a podcast um, and you can share more about it at the end. So we get all the details and I'll link it and all of that. Um, but you have cool. a podcast you. where you have guests on. And I also, obviously I have you as a guest, but outside of this recruiter season, I have kind of mid-level professionals that come on and share their story. Every single one has been open to people contacting them to ask questions. I would imagine it's probably similar for you. Like usually people yeah. who come onto podcasts as guests, they want to help, right? And so those are the types of things, if you're an introvert, especially, you know, seek out some of these opportunities, a podcast or some online event or something like that, where you can really make an easy connection. Hey, I heard you on Julia's podcast. Hey, I heard you on Adrian's podcast. I really love that you said X, Y, Z, you know, mm -hmm. I'd love to connect further. Those are some of the, the connections that people can make that I think sometimes they think they can't. Even yep. though the guest is like, absolutely reach out to me on LinkedIn. They mean it. <laughs> I can <laughs> right. tell you, they yeah. mean it. You know, so take advantage of that, definitely. For sure, yeah. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, on the subject of my podcast, like the whole point of it is to interview people within my space to show them, to show everyone that like recruiting is a big part of what changed their trajectory. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, it was their wife introduced them to somebody and suddenly they're in the supply chain industry and they weren't before. Sometimes it was, you know, uh, a teacher in high school who said, Hey, let me introduce you to this concept. Sometimes it was a problem that they saw, but somehow they got recruited into this industry and that one connection, that one mm -hmm. person, um, which may 
honestly be kind of insignificant how that connection even happened, but the importance, the significance of that pivot is life-changing. And, and, you know, I, I think you can't underestimate that. And sometimes you can control, um, how you, you could put the ball, you could stack the cards in your favor, right. By saying, Hey, I want to try to find these people who can, I want to be around these people. Um, and that will stack the deck in my favor to say the chances of me going down this trajectory uh, or this area, uh, career are a lot higher. Yes. Yes. Ah, love this. I love this conversation. <laughs> so great. Okay. Let's get into some really practical tips because I know cool. people listening, they want the, what do I do? How do I write the resume? How do I do all these things? So cool. let's start with the resume. Uh, mm -hmm. what are kind of your top, I don't know, three resume tips that you have for people? Uh, yes. So don't overthink it. Um, Here's, here's the biggest, here's the biggest thing that I see a lot of people, and this is, this is from my perspective, right? And so, you know, Julie, I know that you're an expert here and, and you'll have some different, probably takes some thoughts, <clears throat> but from what I see a lot of, a lot of people, especially again, this goes back to, you know, um, tr listen to Julia, right? Uh, hear, hear out what I say, because this is something we do every day, right? And you don't write a, you don't write a resume every single day. You write it every few years when you're like, oh crap, I've got this uh, interview or I want to apply for something or, oh my gosh. Um, so most people are like, okay, I got to list everything I've ever done um, and just word vomit all over paper, right? And, and for most people, I know you've done a lot. And for other people, you're like, I have no idea how to put into words how I'm qualified. So think about it this way. Your resume is a chance to tell a story that solves a problem for an organization. Okay. And so if that's the case, what are the problems that an organization needs solved? There's a few, right? And in my experience, there's, there's like five that are main ones. And this is whether it's a nonprofit or it's a for-profit, you need to make money. You need to keep money. You need to find talent. You need to keep talent, keep or develop talent. And then you need to innovate your company. So with those five things, how am I going to solve one of those problems um, for the organization. And that, so think about that and how you write your resume, you know, from start to finish. So think about that. You're telling that story. Now, the other simple, I guess, strategy, I would say, goes in your experience section, right? So I do think there's some really great, you know, things you can do, you know, on just format and stuff like that, but very, very simple on your, you know, experience section is you want to, tell the base. So like, let's just say I worked at McDonald's first. You want to say, Hey, here's the basic responsibilities of my job, right? You know, your company title date, and then basic responsibilities I made, uh, or I worked the drive through window. Um, and then who you served, right? I served, you know, um, you know, community members across the, uh, Los Angeles Metro area and then how you served. So that's a performance metric. Okay. And performance metrics go back to, making money, keeping money, finding talent, keeping talent, innovation. So performance metrics are really important in my opinion in a resume. So I, um, you know, I served 10,000 residents weekly going through the drive-through of the McDonald's restaurant that I, I served in. Um, now, then you, you could say, if, you know, the impact. So the impact was you know, we then created X amount of dollars of revenue because of that um, service that we provided. And then you can put how that improved the organization. And because of my performance um, and how that impacted, we made this much money and um, we were able to do X, Y, Z, right? So we were able to then add more staff um, to our organization, which made, um, you know, made made, made us serve more clients, helped us make more money in subsequent months and also made my job a lot easier. So I wasn't having to, you know, work a crazy shift. You know, you see what I'm saying? Like yeah. there is, there's a formula for it and data is important and solving a problem, uh, is important too. That makes sense. Yes. Yes. Um, I'm going to make a shameless plug for one of my resources <laughs> Great, good, yeah. because that is exactly how I talk about it. So I have a resource called the ultimate resume tip. 
and it is all about writing content for your resume that we don't talk about anything else. We don't talk about format, nothing like that. I have another resource coming out later. That's going to talk about that, but, um, it is, how do you write content? And it, Adrian, it's creepy how specific it is to what you just said, yeah. <laughs> cause this is the first time Adrian and I have ever talked to each other. Yeah. Um, and I put it in that problem solving, uh, format. And so, and then I show you how to write it, the different parts of, you know, your statements and all of that. So if, if you want to know a little bit deeper, how to do what Adrian is talking about, that resource will do that. Um, Go sign up much, for that with Julia. Yep, yep. I will leave a link for it um, in the <laughs> blog post for this episode. I, I don't normally pitch my products on a podcast, but when it aligns like that, it works Might as well really great and it's well, free yeah. that's a free thing that i have out there for people so <laughs> and i mean but that's such a simple um change that you can make right now today that could set you up for success in the future and and the reason is like i think about my own organization like you know um again it goes back to if i have someone who can with data tell me how they're going to improve the organization versus someone who's just listed their responsibilities we'll go use the mcdonald's example again like if someone says, Hey, I made French fries, I did customer service and I cleaned the bathrooms. Like, okay, that's cool. Someone over here can tell me like, yes, but I improved processes and I served so many people that it made this amount of money and it improved the organization. Like I'm interested in this person right. because they understand how a business works, how an organization works, and they can directly relate that to how it could potentially um, serve my organization and help me. So that's why I'm interested in them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it's such an easy switch, honestly. Like once you understand mm -hmm. how to write that way, it yep. makes it easier. And then you also look at your experience and your position in a different way. And you start mm -hmm. to notice different parts. Like, oh, I think I should write that down. That seems like a good metric 100%. <laughs> for the resume. 100%. Okay, let's talk about interview tips. Uh, what are some of your interview tips for people? Because I know people get nervous. They think that, you know, the interview is mm -hmm. like this, this big, scary thing. What What do you have to say there? <laughs> uh, it sometimes can be scary, right? Like, I think, and, and the reason I say that is like, yeah, I mean, it, it depends on the organization. I, I've seen some organizations who have just terrible interview problems processes. And so, you know, I mean, I get the fact that it could be uncomfortable and, you know, um, and all that. Here's what I'll say. First and foremost, like it's only a job interview, right? Meaning um, I know it might feel, and I've been in this position by myself where it feels like I have to have this, or I want this so bad. Mm -hmm. Play the scenario out in your head before you ever go into that interview. Meaning like Worst case scenario, they tell you you're not a fit at all and you do not get the job. Walk yourself through that just in case. And so you've already dealt with it internally um, to know that, hey, if it doesn't happen, who am I, right? Where is, right. what is my identity? And know that your identity is not tied to your workplace, right? Your identity is, is in something much bigger um, and a purpose. And, and, and you know, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I believe, I believe that your identity is tied to, uh, you know, God and, and who he created you to be personally. So know that your, your identity is not tied to, um, to your work, even though I've been guilty my whole life of being like, you know, I'm Adrian, the athlete or Adrian, the football player, Adrian, the business guy or whatever. Don't worry about that. Um, so play that out in your head. And it's just an interview. It's just an interview. Second um, is just be authentic. Um, and I know people say that, and it feels very cliche, what I mean by that is, um, you know, they're going to ask you questions, you know, um, yeah, obviously you're going to be as prepared as, as you can, but, you know, just answer it authentically as you can. If you don't know the answer to something, never lie, <laughs> like never lie. Cause you're, you're at hundred percent of the time, they're going to be like, I know that you are lying. Like mm -hmm. they're thinking that like when you were trying to, to walk through and struggle with something, mm -hmm. but just, just always say, Hey, I don't know the answer to that right off the top, but I would love to uh, to get an answer for you and, and reach back out to you on that. Um, and if you don't know, and there's something to that, I would say, why is that so important? Hey, I don't know, but why is that so important? The more questions that you can ask and inquisitive you are, the more likely 
that they're going to say like, man, they are authentic and I'm interested in uh, working with them because they actually really cared and they, they have a desire to learn. So be authentic. Yeah. Don't take it too seriously. Be authentic. And then, um, you know, I, I think I would, I would say like the dress for success and follow up, I think are, are important. You know, um, I always, I always say like, you always want to overdress rather than underdress for, for an interview. Like, you know, don't wear a tuxedo to any interviews or anything like that, but, um, always ask ahead of time. In my, my opinion, like, Hey, what's the dress code like there? Is it business casual or the, is it formal or, you know, um, and then dress a step above that. And then, uh, follow up on my opinion, I think for the interviews is, you know, it's different than it used to be, but I think the easiest way is just sending an email. Like that's, that's a low bar. You can do more, but at minimum, at minimum, always at least send an email to say, Hey, thank you so much. Um, and that's, that's where I would start on the interview stuff. Yes. Oh my gosh. I love the, you know, don't, don't lose yourself in the interview. You know, you, you're not tied <laughs> to this yeah. one opportunity. You can get another job. Yeah. You can get, you another, can get job. another job. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. And I think sometimes, especially if we're in a place of desperation in the job search and we just want out of our situation so bad, or we've been unemployed, whatever the scenario is, we really latch on to those interview, you know, uh, opportunities, sometimes to a fault that then you have to go through like a, a mourning process, essentially, if you don't get right. the position, which you are right. still going to do, um, you know, because right. you've put so much time and effort into the process. If you don't get it, you still do need to mourn it. But you know, yeah, not wrapping up your whole identity and whether or not you get a position is right. Well, yeah, yeah, because if you make yourself a slave to their to that process, then you're gonna make yourself a slave to your identity once you if you do get the job too, and you'll be miserable then because you're always trying to be good enough for that organization or somebody who works there, and you don't want to start out that way. You want to start out by knowing like, hey, I'm, I am good enough. I am confident enough. Um, you know, God's made me. He's got a plan for me to be good enough. Um, and you're going to be great whether you get that job or not. You got to start. You got to start there. And if you haven't started there, I said, hey, do some self-work, right? Talk talk to, to, to somebody and, and get yourself there um, as best you can. Yeah. One thing I also want to mention, um, I moderated a panel of recruiters not too long ago. And one of, the, one of the things we talked about was don't underestimate the recruiter uh, interview. And so whether that's with an right. agency like what you do or an internal recruiter, I think sometimes people think that's a throwaway interview. Um, that doesn't matter. I've, ha I've had people come to me and be like, oh, it's just a recruiter. That doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, no, they're the gatekeeper. They're mm -hmm. the one that's going to hype you up to the hiring manager or the team, whatever the situation is. Right. And I, I mean, I'd love to know your thoughts on that, but that was kind of my, my piece of advice in this, uh, in this panel was don't, you know, don't overlook it. Yeah, I, I think that's great advice. Um, I, you know, I have recruited internally and externally. Um, and I know there are situations where um, you may have to speak with, um, you know, a young recruiter who is new and they're just literally reading questions off of a, a paper and it feels like, man, this is, this is tough. But I'll give it to you from my, my point of where I am today, right? I have the ear of a whole bunch of CEOs, business owners, VP executives of multi-million dollar, billion dollar businesses. They have asked me to find fantastic people. And if I say this person is, you have to, you need to talk with them, they're going to listen to me. And if I say, you know, hey, here is where I have a concern on someone. They're going to listen to me, um, and it's it, it because I've I've done this long enough, and I I've built a business and a reputation to say I, I understand what I'm talking about, and I, and ultimately, you know, we understand what integrity looks like in the business world, in the transportation and logistics space too. 
never, ne there, are, there are no throwaway interviews, right? There are no throwaway interviews. And, um, you know, I, I understand we're all busy. I understand we have things to do, but like um, be, be focused and locked in on everything, um, on every single interview, because you never know how that will reflect on you. So. Right. Right. Oh, yes. Love that. Okay. What do you think are some things that job seekers should be doing in their search, but they aren't? This will go back to what we talked about earlier. There's a, probably a lot of other tactical things um, um, that, that exist. My biggest one is like, just go be aggressive. And uh, again, I know this is my personality type, but listen, 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 listen. Like you've got, it's life or death out there, man. Like you, you have to think about it that way. And I, when I struggled searching and finding jobs, um, it was because I was not aggressive enough and I didn't know that I had to be aggressive enough. But like, think about it. Like if I'm like, okay, if somebody says, okay, you know, I'm, I'm, I have zero dollars and like, I have to go sell, I don't know, something to, to like, for my family to eat. I betcha that I'm going to go figure out how to sell something. Mm -hmm. So my family can eat, like, I'm going to figure it out because it's, it's life or death, man. It's life or death in your career. Right. And that in the, and we live in a capitalistic society where like somebody else is working really hard at whatever role that you're looking at, whether you're a data analyst or you're a supply chain manager or you're a salesperson and somebody else is, is competing. So I'm not saying like you have to, you know, work a hundred hours a week and, you know, get up at 2 a.m. and, you know, rescue puppies and then work out and then go to work, you know, like, right. Like I, I know there's a lot of weird stuff out there, but what I am saying is, you have to be aggressive and you have to be very intentional about the job search process. And that means that um, if you don't have a job and you need a job, that is your full-time job and that you do have to make a checklist and make a list of people that you have to go out and um, try to connect with and try to take the coffee and try to ask questions for um, and jobs that you need to apply for um, because it is, it is life and death. And if you don't approach it like that, well, um, somebody else is going to get the job because they are approaching it that way. They are saying, Hey, I am qualified. I'm working hard. I am networking, I'm getting to know people and you're going to get beat by those people. So, right. right. Yes. I, Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> I agree with that because you have to want it. You, you have to want it. And I, I just feel like so many people are approaching the job search passively these days because yep. of the online systems. Um, and I know that's not everybody, you know, I'm making some generalizations, but I see it so much, you know, I've yeah. applied to hundred positions. Every time I read one of those, you know, <laughs> posts on LinkedIn, I applied to over a hundred positions and blah, blah. I'm like, that's not a flex. Right. Like, that is not the flex that you think it is. All right. that tells yeah, yeah. me is you don't have the network and you didn't have right. the target in what you were looking for. So it right. tells me that you don't really know what you want and you know, and you're relying. You're just not qualified. Right. Like and, possibly. And, right. Yeah. You, you might need to, you might need to like focus on reality sometimes too. And like, go, go apply for jobs that you're qualified for. Um, and, and maybe if you are qualified, yeah, you, you got to go find the network and you've got to, you've got to do something different because that's not working. Why are you yeah. doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, you know? Yeah. I mean, I would say if, if you're applying to multiple positions a day, you're not spending your time in the right places for that. You got to spend your time building those relationships, you know, max, I would say apply to like one or two positions a week, maybe right. <laughs> because they need to align. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And Julia, you know, I know you've got a lot of probably more thoughts on this than, than, than I do, but like my personal recommendation, like if I was talking to, you know, a friend right now, I would be like, I don't think you should apply for a role until you've spoken to, to someone who works there, either a recruiter or a hiring manager or so, to some, of some sort. That's personally like, and it's because I know how the, how the job market works. Like, and, and I know that probably feels confusing to some people. But, um, you know, 
your best chance is connecting with a real human being first. I know, and I've gotten jobs by just applying to the, the ATS, but the best jobs that I've gotten are connecting with real people, real human beings first. Uh, and then sometimes I even learned that, you know, like, okay, well, maybe I'm not a, a, the right fit for this role, but I might be for this role over here. And, and you've got to connect with people. It, it, it's right. people, people business. Yes. Yeah. And I think, especially if we're talking about values aligned careers and values right. aligned, you know, when you're trying to find a company, a manager, and you're trying to align all of these things together, you're playing a long game. Right. And so we have a different strategy for that than we do for, I need to pay my bills and put food on the table. If that's right. your situation, you just need to get a job. <laughs> like that, <laughs> right. Just get a job. It does not matter what yep. the job is. That's kind of your throwaway. Right. But if we're talking about long term, trying to align, if you have time, right? If you like your job right now, but you know you want to shift into something, play that long game and start to build those relationships now so that when you do want to transition, you have that network already set. Or in the best case scenario, an opportunity comes to you because you're clear about what you want next step or long term in your career and you have people who are looking out for you. So. For sure. Yes. 100% agree with all that. Love this. Okay. I want to go ahead and, and get us wrapped up here. Any last <laughs> thoughts or tips for the audience? Man, you, you know, I don't know if I have any major, you know, life-changing things. I, I do think, you know, from a career standpoint, I think being intentional is just, is really important, you know? So, and that's hard. If you know exactly what you want, the, the only tips I would give you is like, go find people doing that right now. And, and like you said, go, go get to know them, ask them questions, take them to coffee, try to be their, their friend, like, um, you know, get in touch. Like you have to get in touch with people doing what you want to do. If you ever have a chance of becoming what you want to do. So that's one, if you don't know what you want to do, um, man, my, my encouragement for you would be to, would be to really do some soul searching and, and one, like write down, Hey, here's what I enjoy here's what I enjoy, here's what I'm good at, and then ask other people what you, what they think you would be good at. And when you can put those things together, um, you're going to realize, um, hey, there are some possible big major themes that um, I should then try. And then you got to break stuff. And <laughs> I mean, break stuff is like, you got to get your hands dirty. And that might mean you try a couple different jobs over a, you know, a few years and hey, maybe I hate this, um, but I really like this aspect of it. Great, that's good, you're learning. Now go try something else that might uh, kind of iterate and help you find that thing that you're gonna love. But walking into the perfect dream job right off the bat is like a myth. People don't do that. It's just not reality. <laughs> You got to trust no, that. Yes. Oh, I love that. Okay. That's like the perfect ending <laughs> for this episode. <laughs> Why don't you share with people? How can they connect with you? How can they learn more? I think, especially yep. for some of our supply chain people who might be interested in positions, what is the best yep. way to reach out to you? Yeah. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, it's um, Adrian Chapman. Um, you can email me if you want to as well. It's Adrian at COV3 Consulting. Uh, dot com. I've got a podcast. That's a great way to kind of, you know, get to know me, what I do and some of the people I work with and their great stories. It's called recruiting stories. If you just look that up on uh, Apple, Spotify, wherever, and, uh, and you can find that as well. All right. Awesome. And I will leave the links to all of those things um, in the blog post for this episode. Adrian, thank you again. This was so great. Thank you for coming on being a guest. Thanks for having me, Julie. I appreciate it.